Good morning to everybody. Uh, welcome on behalf of SAFE and CFS to a lecture on debt sustainability, a global perspective. Uh, our speaker today is Ludger Schuknecht, who has a brilliant career in public ad administration, but what is quite unusual, he has also published quite a number of articles, books, uh, especially on the fiscal policy. His current position is <clears throat> vice president and corporate secretary at the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, after a short period of uh, professorship in Singapore, he was deputy secretary general at the OECD. And uh, he spent a uh, long time at the German finance ministry as the chief economist. Uh, and before, this is the time when I learned him to know, he uh, supported the staff in a very important position at the European Central Bank. Uh, we are glad, Ludger, to have you here. You have been here at the center and SAFE before. So we are certainly looking forward to an interesting presentation. Jan, now I hand over to you. Thank you, Otmar. Uh, this is Jan Kahn from SAFE speaking. And I'm very happy to welcome Ludger as well. And I'm also very grateful for Otmar to give some introductory remarks to our joint event today. Um, let me say a few technical things. We have um, an hour for the entire um, event. So we will end around 11 o'clock. Um, Ludger will give a talk. I don't know exactly how long it will last, but may maybe 20, 30 minutes or, or 30 minutes or something like this. And uh, <clears throat> in the meantime, I'm looking into the Q&A or those of you who have the German version of Zoom, F and A, F and A um, uh, panel on the screen where you can deposit your questions. And I'll try to use the most interesting and important questions then and hand them over to Ludger so that we have also a debate um, uh, with, uh, with you as the participants. Uh, I think it's a fantastic topic um, and that sustainability is somehow on everybody's mind uh, these days, be they um, oriented towards, uh, let's say, Germany as a, as a state in, in Europe, be they interested in Europe as a whole, which is starting big debt programs, or uh, do we take a view of uh, all the countries around the world that may be even uh, higher indebted than uh, some countries here, here in Europe. And for that reason, I'm very happy to um, have Ludger here, who is really in a position to give us a global view of these things, of the, of the debt sustainability discussion, and maybe also of instruments and policies that one might, might uh, envision to, uh, to be prepared. Um, Ludger is, as Otmar said already, at the Asian um, uh, in Infrastructure Investment Bank, which is in a way um, a prototype of a bank that produces debt uh, on, on the other side of its, uh, not only its balance sheet, but also its client's balance sheet. So um, Ludger, who had always had a very critical eye on, on debt situations uh, when he was here in Frankfurt, and we interacted quite a lot on that. Um, will probably not have completely changed his view, but we'll, we'll, I'm very interested to hear how you now think about this issue. So the floor is yours, Ludger. Welcome again here in Frankfurt. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, Otmar, for this very kind introduction and invitation. Uh, while we are putting the slides on, uh, I'm... Uh, okay, so I think the slides should be showing now. Um, great. Now, this is a very controversial topic where until recently, I think there was a clear tendency to say that debt sustainability is not really an issue, uh, neither globally nor in countries, given the zero interest rate environment, 
And given the hope that, um, you know, with uh, even more spending, perhaps, and high deficits, growth could be boosted so that it would finance debt itself. But perhaps most recently, um, you know, with inflation resurging and the prospect of high, higher financing costs, um, this, this issue has <clears throat> perhaps become more open and more, more um, you know, the, the, the mainstream view that was clearly um, uh, oriented towards, you know, not worrying about that. It may have become more of an issue now, also given the fact that we are not only dealing with a lot of public debt, but also private debt and a lot of uh, public debt on central bank balance sheets. So that um, just, you know, as in the past, when these issues have been closely intertwined, perhaps that is a more relevant issue again than, uh, than we saw it some months ago. And um, let me go through my presentation. I think I will spend about half an hour. Um, I, I'm, you may want to choose to have your, your, your bar with the, uh, the, the uh, faces uh, minimized so that you can see the full slides. Um, because sometimes, you know, especially on the right side of the slides, you have the most important part of the, of the slides. So <clears throat> let me start. Um, to my mind, uh, debt and debt sustainability is a serious issue of concern. Um, this chart says already a lot because it shows that um, basically today, public debt is in advanced countries at the same level as right after World War II for the average of advanced countries as defined by the IMF at 120% of GDP for the average of the G7, even higher at 140% of GDP. And if somebody had predicted such numbers 15 years ago before the global financial crisis, they, they, you know, people's, uh, they would have a breakout of sweat. But uh, today um, we have still, we are still in an environment where despite such high debt financing costs for governments are relatively low and the spreads even for very highly indebted countries are also still very low. But we also know that uh, perceptions of markets and investors often change very quickly and certainly they can over time. Now, if we, um, if we look a bit at the history, um, there's, an interesting pattern for advanced countries in that public debt since its trough in the 70s has never really gone down, not even in good times, not even in the boom periods of the 80s, the mid 90s to mid 2000s. And then after the global financial crisis at best debt stagnated, stabilized, and then went up again in, a big, in, in big leaps. Uh, the situation of emerging economies is slightly different. They are, they are public indebtedness is also at a record high on average, but their pattern of indebtedness in recent decades has followed more the Keynesian pattern of you know, bringing debt down in good times and then uh, letting it rise again in uh, bad times. And while for advanced countries, we see more uh, of a one-sided Keynesianism uh, at work. Um, but it's not just high public debt that is relevant for debt sustainability. It is also the prospect of private sector liabilities potentially migrating to the public sector. Um, <clears throat> there are future liabilities like population aging, like the impact of climate change, geopolitical tensions. And um, so, so, so debt sustainability is a relatively complex and comprehensive uh, issue that needs to be looked at in a holistic manner. And while we see these, to my mind, dramatic numbers, especially for large advanced countries, and I come back to that in a second, there is little sense of urgency, perhaps a little bit more now, slowly starting, but there is still little sense of urgency on how to deal with public debt and how to bring it down. So here are some details. You don't need to look at the numbers, just the patterns are really that uh, public debt in the G7 has risen from what slightly above 80% to 140%. So by 60% of GDP in just a span of 14 years, deficits are near double digit in many uh, uh, advanced countries. And then uh, I also put some details on the slides here on emerging economies, where you see that 
again, also in the emerging economies, it's the largest ones that are the most indebted, um, especially, I mean, if you look at Argentina at 100%, Brazil at 100% of GDP, India at over 80, China at 70, but we know that China also has a lot of quasi-public liabilities in state-owned enterprises and elsewhere. So the situation is, the numbers are slightly lower in emerging economies, but on the whole, we are in a situation of record global indebtedness. And there are two major risk factors for the future that uh, we, well, at least the first one is well known and actually quite predictable. That's the impact from population aging. And on the left, you just see the projections of um, the spending increase due to population aging in a number of advanced uh, countries and China where uh, the rapid aging in, each, aging in East Asia means the uh, spending on uh, health and uh, pensions, that's these two uh, colors here, uh, is the highest. But also in most advanced countries, public spending will increase by maybe about three, four, five percent of GDP in the, la in the next 30 years uh, due to population aging. And just mind you, um, three, four, five percent of GDP is roughly the public budget on public investment or even public education. So this is a huge increase, even if it sounds small you know, on the surface. Uh, France is the only country where we don't expect an increase, um, but that France has the highest social expenditure ratio of all advanced countries. It's near one third of GDP. So the others are a bit catching up. Uh, the second major risk factor for debt sustainability is financial instability. I hinted at that as well, and I think to the audience this uh, should be no surprise and nothing, no, no new point. But uh, perhaps the numbers here on the, in this chart show you the potential magnitude of fiscal risks coming from financial crisis. We've had here, uh, here you see here the, 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 the debt curve for four countries uh, over the, from the mid 90s to mid 2010s, where, you know, debt went down very slowly or was stable in the good times, you know, the one-sided uh, phenomenon that I said before, mentioned before, and then they shot up in the financial crisis in some countries like Ireland, because it was really a triple crisis, a fiscal crisis, a competitiveness crisis, and a banking crisis. But even in the UK, where it was really only a banking crisis, uh, public debt went up by 50, almost 50% 50 of GDP. And that shows you that um, the, the, the magnitude of, uh, of uh, the fiscal impact of a financial crisis can be huge. And before the European crisis, we only thought this was possible in emerging economies and or in developing economies. And many of these common eco economies ex actually experienced such debt increases and then went belly up and went into fiscal crisis like, like some of the European countries. And while we have done a lot to mitigate risks in the financial sector, uh, we have also now a lot more debt in the private sector than 15 years ago. We have the risks in the non-bank financial sector that the DIS uh, is often referring to and where we don't really know how that will translate into uh, affect public finances. But we also know that imbalances, for instance, in pension system and corporate indebtedness, uh, even if they go through the non-bank uh, financial sector, there is a good chance that uh, when, you know, the uh, proverbial shit hits the fan, that then the public sector will be asked for support. So um, next, let me go through a couple of factors that are typically not considered in the uh, debt sustainability analysis. The first one is the size and effectiveness of government. Uh, this chart shows you the size of the public sector across a range of industrial countries, starting with Singapore, the smallest public sector, Ireland, Switzerland, also quite small, or in the 30% range. And then you go up to Italy, France, even Germany, which uh, now in the COVID pandemic feature public spending well above 50% of GDP, even 60% and above in France and uh, Italy. And these are magnitudes that, that are causing uh, concerns to my mind from the sheer fact that they are not financed. 
not a single advanced country has been able to sustainably finance much more than 50% of GDP in the past decades. So 60% of GDP, I mean, there is just no way to finance that in a sustainable manner from, so to speak, a revealed Leffer curve perspective. And um, you see here that countries like Ireland and Switzerland with much smaller public sectors, of course, you know, then spending went up, but they are still in magnitudes where uh, the financing side of public spending is not really an issue. Um, but this is not just about the size of government as regards financeability. It's also about the implications this has for the competitiveness of countries. Because if you have public spending of 50, 60% of GDP, you have to raise much more, much higher taxes. And I think we've seen already in recent years some tendency, you know, that all, not just the BRICS have moved, uh, followed a favorable tax system, but brains as well. And I can tell from my own experience in Singapore, where uh, um, the uh, uh, tax, person income tax is, is just quite low. And so, you know, with a good income, you have a lot of cash in your pocket. And uh, that is not the case in the high tax advanced countries. And then the question is, you know, where, where do the brains go? Where, what is the competition in the future? Is it over bricks or over brains? I would say it's going to be mainly over brains. And then um, if you have brain drain, as we know it, and as we already experience in Italy and some of the countries not in the list here, then that could further undermine growth and the sustainability of a public debt. Um, and then link that up uh, to the point that generally in emerging economies, public expenditure ratios are about 10% below those of advanced countries. And then you can see that we have a major uh, um, advantage for emerging economies in smaller government countries. Uh, due to lower spending and lower taxes. And then the question is, of course, is this compensated by better government services, by better quality of life? And it is true for some countries with big governments, we have relatively high quality of life and government performance indicators like the Nordics. But as you can see on the chart, uh, in the chart of the left, there is no positive correlation, certainly no positive correlation between the size of government and government performance. Uh, this chart is from another, from a book of mine on public spending that came out in 2020, and that basically shows that the countries with relatively small public sectors like Switzerland and Australia and Ireland have the highest performance indicators of government in terms of the public administration, education, health, econ economy, stability, even income distribution uh, is not bad in these countries. Uh, and they have much better performance indicators than the big government countries. And then we have one group of country that is uh, particularly poor in terms of government performance. But even in areas where you think government spending might make a bigger difference, you don't see the correlation between spending and the outcomes of public spending. And that's, for instance, education. And that's also true for infrastructure, for health and uh, uh, other areas you can think of. Uh, here, it's like uh, you have Japan and Korea with very high PISA scores and low public spending, and uh, Canada and Finland with high PISA scores and high public spending or higher public spending. But it doesn't really seem to matter, you know, how much countries spend. It's much more relevant what kind of governance in your education system you have, even if you're just for the private component of, of spending. So that was the first factor, the size of government and the quality of government that could uh, impair uh, uh, debt sustainability and that we have basically in the analysis not on our radar. The second one is that growth could potentially be lower. Now, this is not, uh, most of the things mentioned here are not original, uh, my original thoughts uh, at all. Uh, they're well known that, uh, you know, if the rules of the game, the framework conditions of countries are worsening, then potential growth tends to go down. Decarbonization is likely to cost us some growth uh, over the coming years uh, before, in the long run, we have more growth due to a better climate uh, and zombification of our economies, protectionism. These are all uh, dangers that are well known. But if you look at the estimates for long-term potential growth, it seems that that 
is delinked. If you look at, for instance, the commission's forecast for the next 10 years as in, included in their sustainability analysis, there is no change. There's a bit of change due to population aging, but there is no change from worsening structural, uh, worsening structural environment. It is given, it is taken as a given, and uh, the, the uh, potential growth, uh, long-term growth trends are assumed to be pretty stable. Um, that, I think, is an optimistic assumption, and we might have surprises, as we perhaps already have a, you know, we, we see already now with the supply chain and the problems that interact with protectionism and some other factors. The slide here just shows that when you look at the government effectiveness, but also if you take rule of law, you see that in most advanced countries, uh, the, the indicators are still higher than in most emerging economies, but emerging economies are catching up and advanced countries are falling behind or falling back. And uh, 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 Asia, Asia is in particularly on an upward path. Now, financial distortions and financial stability, that brings me back to the risk described above. Um, maybe I, I, uh, I, um, I, but I think it's again also the, 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 uh, the compound effect of the various factors that could matter particularly for debt sustainability. We, we, there's plenty of literature arguing that there's been excessive risk-taking at credit growth, that there's a risk of an asset price boom bust cycle. Central bank balance sheets are loaded with government debt uh, and uh, there's a money overhang and a decline in money velocity. I will Otmar refer to that in some of his recent writing. And uh, so the demand and supply and monetary factors may also be in place for higher inflation uh, and higher financing costs, which could then uh, impact on debt sustainability and perceived debt sustainability from that angle, while central banks may have used a lot of their balance sheet space for uh, quantitative easing without adverse effects. That, I mean, of course, is an open question, but we don't know how, how far, far this, uh, 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 we can go further on this path and Japan may not be the model for everybody. Now, all these uh, financial and growth and fiscal factors are taking place in an environment that today shows much financial interdependence internationally and with open capital markets. Uh, here, just some, some additional uh, um, facts. Uh, that show that global credit, international credit is almost 40% of global GDP, 30 trillion. Uh, the BIS argues that the amount of potentially volatile assets in shadow banking amount to $50 trillion, uh, two thirds of global GDP. So there is a lot of uh, uh, potential for volatility coming from global financial markets when there is a shift in investor sentiment. And I think we've seen a hint of that in the in last May, May of 2020, when within days, uh, you know, just be, with relatively moderate disinvestments by international and hedge fund investors in the U.S. Treasury markets, basically that market had to be bailed out. So the power of inter volatile international capital flows is is quite uh, impressive. Now, uh, at the same time, um, I, I mentioned the uh, role of. Uh, advanced country central banks in um, uh, pursuing expansionary monetary policies and thereby by, uh, buying government debt. That has also in the pandemic uh, been extended to some emerging economies. And of course, I mean, the, the concerns here are not so much whether that was the right policy at that moment. The question is, you know, is there, uh, how, how can governments exit? How are gonna, how are and central banks, how, how are financial markets gonna behave? How, where are interest rates gonna be when this is gonna come to a, to a stop? On the right, a last chart on the uh, situation in emerging economies where, you know, much of the debate on sustainability risk currently, especially if you look at the IMF, for instance, or other developing banks features or looks at emerging economies in developing countries. But I'm not so sure it is that it is justified in the long run. In the short run, and when you look at individual countries, certainly. But I think there are two interesting trends. The first one I mentioned, the indebtedness is really the highest in the biggest advanced countries. Smaller countries have often been much more prudent. And the second factor that comes in here is that we don't really know who are going to be the safe havens in the future. And uh, we, there is some evidence that, for instance, the, um, the 
uh, sin of uh, foreign currency indebtedness is going down, more local currency debt in emerging economies. There's also some empirical evidence uh, that shows that countries uh, that have lower deficits and lower debt, emerging economies have been are much less vulnerable to runs. Uh, that already showed up in the global financial crisis and received relatively little attention here in advanced countries that we, we don't really know who's going to be, so to speak, on the good side or the bad side of contagion. Um, so let me conclude with four scenarios of debt reduction. The first one used to be kind of the conventional wisdom one, the Washington consensus one, you, if, if you're in fiscal trouble, if your debt sustainability is at risk, uh, debt will have to come down, so you have to consolidate and that way bring down deficits and reform and that way bring down debt. And that's still the strategy that many countries have employed in recent decades and are likely to follow in the future. But I doubt that it is going to happen in, uh, given the political environment and the sense of urgency that is lacking, I doubt that this is really uh, happening in the uh, advanced, big advanced countries and maybe not even in the big emerging economies. The second option is debt restructuring. restructuring. The last one in advanced countries we've seen was in Greece. Uh, in emerging economies, we have seen many. But is this a realistic option for the very high debt countries? I doubt it. It would raise a lot of fiscal, financial, legal issues. Even if legally it is possible, uh, I'm wondering how realistic it is given the repercussions it would have then on financial stability. The third one is financial repression, which means you have interest rates below inflation and below nominal growth. And that is happening right now. But the question is how far and how fast will financing costs catch up? And will, is, this, is this financial repression a transitory phenomenon that uh, uh, works only for a short time? Or for, is it gonna be stable and workable for the longer run? Now, again, if you look at the sustainability analysis of the commission, it assumes that for the next 10 years, there is a strong positive effect on debt reduction through uh, interest rates below growth rates of the magnitude of 10 to 20% across countries, 10 to 20% of GDP. So that's quite huge. But even that is not enough to bring down debt from say 150% in Italy to a safe level of, well, I don't know what safe is in the future, but maybe 80, 100 is, uh, is safer than 150 and closer to the 60% that used to be kind of like the norm of safety. Um, the, so the question is how long is this interest rate effect? How big is it? How long is it gonna work? I argue it's not going to be big enough even over a decade to, to solve big high debt countries' problems. And we always have the temptation that some of these savings from low interest rates are spent, and that has happened in the past. The second is, question is, how stable is this scenario? And uh, we've some historical experiences where countries have tried to maintain low interest rates and thereby support the economy and reduced debt, and it worked in the 50s and 60s to some extent. It worked in the 2010s in some countries, UK, US, but in all these cases, the magnitudes again was limited. And then we know what happened in the 60s and 70s when governments through miscalculation and policy errors uh, got out, uh, lost, so to speak, control and uh, financial repression turned into destabilization. And that is the first, fourth uh, scenario at the bottom of this slide. So um, the first scenario, you know, is this consolidation and reform. Just, just to show you the numbers, uh, uh, here's a small mistake. The red line is the business as usual, meaning high deficits continue, and the black line is a reform scenario. Uh, here, it's interesting that you know, if you start with a deficit of four or 5% and low growth, if you raise growth by 1%, it gives you perhaps 10% of GDP debt reduction over a decade. But if you bring debt to a balanced budget from four to zero, you get a lot bigger effect. So I think that 
this consolidation and reform uh, scenario will not work without serious consolidation in many countries, given high deficits today. It is an illusion to believe that growth, higher growth alone will do the job. The second scenario that default, I don't need to show you. I mean, that is kind of like, um, you, you can have many scenarios there. The third one, financial repression. Uh, here, the, the, the red line is the 2% inflation, zero interest line. Uh, if you have 2% inflation and zero interest rates, basically the real value of your debt falls by 50% in one generation. But again, also assets, real value fall by 50% in one generation. And who holds cash at 0%? That alludes to the distributional effect of financial repression. Financial repression tends to hit those who hold cash and liquid assets, and that's more the lower and middle classes than the, than the rich. So that's an important distributional implication. The fourth scenario of destabilization, um, here I should mention, I, the, my presentation is going to come out as a small book with Cambridge University Press uh, as Cambridge Element in International Economics in the coming month. And um, I describe in more detail how, from a political economy perspective, destabilization scenarios could emerge out of financial repression, uh, where especially, you know, the central banks will be in a very uh, prominent role and have to decide whether they give in to the pressure from governments or the financial sector, fiscal financial dominance, uh, or whether they tighten. But even if they tighten, uh, you know, they are also, they can be between a rock and a hard place where a policy tightening then causes or uh, go, come, goes together with bursting asset price bubbles. So in both cases, there could be destabilization if debt is simply too high. Uh, and uh, that would then need consolidation and reform. And um, here, you know, historically, one could kind of then say, okay, and then the IMF has to come in, like in uh, some European countries or advanced countries. But my question here is really whether, um, given that debt is a global phenomenon, the most indebted countries are the big ones, whether that is really the scenario we need to worry about. It is the scenario to worry about is not whether Sri Lanka is going bust or chart. The scenario is what is happening in the big economies. And I think there, the 60s and 70s and 80s have a lot to tell us. Um, uh, you, here, this is just one element uh, last March, we had a um, uh, we had this run on the dollar on the treasury market uh, when uh, three about 300 billion of um, in foreign reserves dollar reserves were were sold. Um, now, dollar reserves are seen by countries as a safe assets uh, to stabilize their economies. But I think the lesson that the Asian countries that hold five trillion in dollar reserves today that they have kind of gotten from this is that even if the sell-off was 5% of the uh, reserve holdings, that so to speak, if, if, if th th that the stabilizing role of reserves might be much less than, than they thought. And um, you see here another thing, that the pound used to be the dominant reserve currency. And between the mid 60s and mid 70s, the reserve role of the pound went from 30% to zero. And that really stoked uh, the destabilization and in inflation in the UK. Now, I don't want to design any doomsday scenarios, but I, I, I think that um, the safety of advanced country debt markets in the past decade, or at least of most of the advanced country debt markets, hinges on the very fact that people have trust and confidence in it. And it can happen, it has happened in the 70s, that this trust was lost also by the largest countries. And in today's uh, internationally uh, mobile uh, capital environment, the implications of that are going to be likely to be very different than in the past. And I think the global financial crisis and the European fiscal crisis kind of gave a hint of that, but uh, not the full picture. So let me stop here. Thank you. So... Thank you for this very interesting um, overview over the topic, I would say. And um, also with the four scenarios, you gave us basically alternative path. Uh, let me start with a, with a basically in a way, a wrap up question. 
these paths have been in different directions, uh, what policy action um, is concerned. Could you imagine that a mix of these four is what we will see in the end? Um, so financial repression, um, maybe <clears throat> combined with um, debt restructuring, for instance, uh, apart from consolidation efforts anyway. And uh, in that um, field, I wonder why you put so little emphasis on debt restructuring, which in a way would be the normal market-oriented solution that one could imagine, right? Imposing market discipline, allowing prices to play the role of, um, of, uh, of signaling where such restructuring is likely. So basically, it's almost a, a low-cost solution for the whole that sustainability issue. Why is that not playing such a big role in your argument? Yeah, thank you. And I, I think indeed we are likely to see a mix and my, that would be my baseline. My, my baseline scenario is still that we get by without, so to speak, that um, the more, more um, awful uh, scenario of a destabilization in uh, large advanced countries. Um, I, uh, I think that um, we can we can assume that um, the debt restructuring scenario has, to my mind, the problem that um, today the um, the debt, especially of adver even of emerging and developing economies, is um, is not just with banks where you can then, and governments, where you can go to the Paris club and the London club, and then you find a solution. It's more complicated today. We have a lot more bonded debt, a lot of more private sector involvement. And um, so I, I think that first of all, technically um, debt restructions with a, variant, with a varied group of private sector actors is, is difficult and politically, um, I. Uh, you, you see how what is happening in the G20. The, um, there is an attempt to create a new common framework for debt restructuring, and they're having great problems even with kind of relatively small and single symbol economies like Chad and Zambia, um, because also China is one of the big uh, creditors. Um, so I think um, politically the uh, debt restructuring scenario is not. Uh, as straightforward, even for the small and poorer countries. Now, remember um, the Greeks' experience. Um, <coughs> from a political economy perspective, I think that was already quite traumatic for some countries, not only Greece, but also for those who feared to be next. So my uh, expectation is that, especially in Europe, um, the concern will be um, then about how to mutualize that debt rather than restructure it. And uh, then the, uh, this, this pressure will be again on the ECB, but also on governments, because the ECB may say interest rates need to rise, or we cannot at least, do, at least we cannot do more, and then it will be on governments. And then just like in the 2000, early 2010s, no government wants to pull the plug on this. So I don't think that uh, debt restructuring is going to be a very relevant issue in Europe. And then if you look at the very large countries, Japan and the US, I mean, if anything, uh, they would go the financial repression inflation path. And uh, there, therefore, I think that, yes, debt restructuring will play a role for some of the smaller and, and maybe medium-sized developing countries. Uh, but I don't think it will play a bigger role than that. Okay, so let me take um, to the to the FNA, to the Q&R session. So the, I, I now look at the questions in the chat and let, let me summarize some of these questions. So I, I, there's one, Thomas Meyer is one of the persons who asked questions and one that he's, he's uh, um, uh, emphasizing is that after World War II, losers of the war brought down debt through currency reform. That would be one way to, to solve the debt problem. Uh, and maybe you can comment a little bit on whether currency reforms is a way out of debt when debt is no longer nationally held, which I assume was the case in the World War II session, but internationally held. 
Uh, and uh, he continues, winners uh, did it through financial repression. And there you said something, namely financial repression is very likely to, to be a dominant factor in, in bringing down the, um, the, the, the debt level, basically. Um, but what's your outlook also with respect to both so currency reform and, um, and financial repression? I <clears throat> yeah, thank you. I mean, I, I would not, I would not predict a kind of hyperinflation scenario for any uh, of the large advanced countries. I, I don't think that that is the world we are living in. Um, and the seventies were not such a world either. It was a, a situation where, um, if you look back at the numbers, where inflation in the early, early low interest rates, especially on the debt that had already been contracted for long terms, inflation then helped. And then the financing costs caught up and even uh, it overshot. And then we uh, <clears throat> very high real interest rates in the 80s. So the, um, uh, the 70s, I think, are um, from that angle, not an irrelevant scenario, because what will governments do? You know, we have very volatile financial markets. What will they do? They will basically introduce capital controls. And um, we have already now the talk about price controls. So there are all kinds of controls that you can imagine, short of, so to speak, letting uh, markets collapse and letting uh, currencies, uh, advanced country currencies collapse. And so we, we will be just moving into a much more restrictive regime where then I think we will see some, uh, some yeah, and, you know, that will feed back, back into the growth prospects, into trade. It will cause international trouble and so on. So, so it will be a tumultuous time. If, it, if we don't manage to keep things under control, it will be tumultuous. But I don't think that the kind of post-war or 1923 uh, scenarios are relevant. Um, the other really important factor that helped to bring down debt after World War II, apart from financial repression, was high growth. You know, these countries really just basically grew like crazy. And the prospect for that is very limited. So um, it's, it's, an, it's really an argument to say, uh, let's be careful. I mean, even if today we can contract more debt easily to spend, but let's be careful. First, we don't know whether that additional spending is really productive. That's the quality issue. And with next generation EU, this European debt facility, we see that already that there's you know, issues. How can you spend so much money so quickly productively? And the second one is that you show from, my, from this one sl slide I showed on the time it takes to bring down debt. I mean, historic experience show that even those who did ambitious consolidation, they brought down debt maybe by 15, 20% in 10 years. That's the best in the class maybe by 30% in 15 years. I think Ireland a little bit more, but you know, not everybody can grow like Ireland. And uh, so, so, so if we think that maybe debt sustainability isn't uh, because also because of rising financing costs, rising real interest rates is an issue 10 years down the line. We have to start thinking today because it takes 10 years to, 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 to only reverse the debt increase of the pandemic. So this kind of, this time dimension of debt reduction is on nobody's minds. I see it in no discussion, no written or oral discussion. You cannot just turn the engine off and on and off. Uh, it's budgets and debt are very slow moving, uh, uh, slow mov moving uh, figures. Yeah, if I can add a, a question relating uh, to a post by Thomas Grosse. Um, relating to the real outliers in a way, the countries with very high debt levels, where in a way it seems to be evident that this is not sustainable. Even there, Japan teaches us a lesson in a way, but uh, for these other countries, among the emerging countries in particular, um, question is, is debt forgiveness um, a policy solution that we should also factor in basically, because it's practiced on and off, not on a regular basis, of course, but uh, if you look at it historically, it always happens after a while. I, I, I think so for the smaller countries and the poorer countries, this is going to be an important element. It's going to be part of debt restructuring as, as we had discussed before, because uh, debt for, what, is debt for, what else is debt forgiveness than say, either you, you cut the uh, principal or you, you 
uh, reduce interest rates. And um, that's what we always do. Um, and so it's, it's just a question of who, who forgives the debt. Is it the government sector or is it also the private sector? And I think this is a very important lesson from an economic and a political perspective that uh, it cannot just be private debt migrating to the public sector, also not international public, private debt. The private sector has to share into this forgiveness. Um, and I think that, that, that will be important, but it is, it is not going to be easy. Mm. So uh, um, a very general question by an anonymous uh, guest. Um, does it matter how the money is spent or invested? So sometimes public debt is raised under the statement that this will be used for, let's say, value creating um, investments, infrastructure stuff and so forth. Is that a way that you would distinguish between good, bad and bad, bad, so to speak, consumptive and investive? Definitely. I think that is very important. Um, just, I mean, the reality is that you cannot just jack up investment spending and productive spending significantly in a short period of time. That is, that is simply the, the practice of fiscal policy making speaks against that. I mean, uh, in some emerging economies where you have huge infrastructure gaps, this, this can happen to some extent. And if it's then well done, and if it's happening in a good environment, it can produce good outcomes. In principle, in advanced countries, this could happen too. And the fact that the emphasis now is on doing additional spending for productive things is, is a good, is a good uh, thing. The reality, though, is that investment spending has hardly gone up and is going up very slowly only for practical reasons. And, and uh, most of the spending increase of the past decades has been on social spending with uh, more questionable outcomes for uh, productivity. And the question is whether some of this money we spend in Europe is also not just simply a way to ring fence uh, investment spending and then raise national social security spending. I like the idea of ring fence, frankly, I think the most important point about this debate is that we need to ring fence productive spending against the encroachment of unproductive spending. Um, the, the, uh, that, 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 in that sense, I think the, 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 the quality debate here is, is a very important nuance. But still, there are two reasons why I think it's not even necessary to raise debt to finance infrastructure. First, we all know that today a lot of infrastructure can be financed privately. I mean, in Germany, you know, the whole telecom infrastructure, energy infrastructure, social housing infrastructure, it's all financed privately. And, um, you know, there are very few things that are difficult to finance privately. And uh, the other thing is, you know, yes, you want to raise investment spending, public investment also on certain issues, but then you could maybe also reduce unproductive spending elsewhere. So the, the debate we have a bit now, it kind of, assumes that there is no unproductive spending elsewhere. That's not the case. Yeah, thank you. So let I, I, re, I continue. Sophia uh, Vetter asked the following question. What concretely would be your recommendation for Germany and the Eurozone to successfully improve fiscal discipline, also regarding attempts to further communitize public debt, which diminishes the pressure to decrease debt on national governments? Is there anything you want to recommend from your sustainability perspective on these policy issues? I think the, the role of fiscal frameworks is important. The IMF has just issued a paper, uh, Otmar sent me, that um, <clears throat> is, um, is very uh, uh, relevant in this regard uh, and, uh, and um, uh, shows that also if you have a record of being compliant with fiscal rules, you have more room for increasing spending in crisis. And <clears throat> you also have a record of being more productive in your spending because the reality of government budgeting and fiscal policies is that only if you have constraints, if you have mechanisms in place that force you to be efficient and live within your means, are you gonna actually spend well? If you have no budget constraint, you spend poorly. Uh, so the importance of fiscal rules is very important, but it's not just about the matter about the stability and growth pact. It is uh, about national fiscal rules and institutions very much as well. 
you know you have you have to have national uh, constraints in place and part of the reason why we have had so many problems with the european rules is that the national rules are so poor and so poorly functioning and then you get the political economy to work to erode the european rules because at the national level you don't get your act together so what does it mean for the european debate it means that to my mind the debate has to focus mainly on governance the, the, the debate right now is mainly on policies. Do we need to have more simple or more complicated, more loose, higher targets, lower targets? That's not the point. The point is governance. You agree on a framework and then you implement it. And, um, uh, you know, again, the current framework is way too complicated. That's true. But if it was implemented properly, it would still work. So I think focusing the debate on governance uh, is key. Now, the problem is here that there is no consensus that physical discipline is actually needed. It's all a, it's a lot like you know with uh, uh, with uh, Saint Francis of Assisi who said, "Lord, give me chastity, but not today." So um, <clears throat> we all think we have a lot of time until we really need to do something, and then there's the hope that mutualization will solve crisis. Uh, the my advice on the risk of mutualization in crisis. Um, there is no solution because um, that uh, if if there is no if in crisis there is then no mutualization. See, Greece, the the European the ESM programs with subsidized financing is also a kind of mutualization. The the, 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 the temporary let's call it temporary parking of government debt or in central bank balance sheets is also a kind of at least temporary mutualization. So um, we we have a, we 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 need a, a holistic approach. I, I I would say that maybe the buzzword that would suit here: national fiscal rules, uh, credible European rules, political consensus to actually see debt as a serious issue, and then also the uh, confirmation of central banks to uh, be willing to get out of the current uh, policy regime. I mean, this, this is uh, obviously, I think we can easily agree on these, on, on these, on the importance of these governance issues. The real problem is how to establish credibility when the part partners are uh, sovereigns, right? And are subject to elections and new governments and all that. So this is a, a tough one, right? To make it, to, to make it happen after, I'm, not I'm only the state. I can, if I can add, I mean, from my experience, <laughs> Of course, now austerity is demonized, and you know the, the Schäuble government was guilty of um, you know causing a lot of problems. But in reality, you know, in private talks, many people said behind the in the corridors that uh, the the countries that feel responsibility for the euro need to take also the hard decisions that are necessary, and to signal early on. In this finance area, it's not about being loved and getting the best press, but it is about uh, actually doing what is necessary to have long-term sustainability, and that is the best service for Europe. And maybe we were poor in communication, but also poor in action in the past. And it means that my advice going forward would be to prepare through communication that this, um, that uh, we, we are not going to allow this mega moral hazard. I, I think we need to prepare the public and the governments in Europe for that. And that's not just a German issue because Germany has been also weakened quite a bit through its own policies in recent years. It's kind of a, uh, an obligation, a responsibility of, uh, of, of uh, more than just one government. Uh, maybe in, in, in this direction is a nice question by Holger Schmieding, uh, who's, I'm just reading it, I think it's faster. Governments are locking in low yields. Most countries in Europe will still have falling ratios of interest payments to GDP for a few years, even as yields rise. And so you can make that argument yourself because they, have, they still substitute even higher paying old debt with newer paying, lower paying new debt. Um, so how, and his question is, what is your timeline for potential debt sustainability issues to appear in major advanced economies? That is, that is really the key question. And I mean, it's, um, 
I, I think we have a couple of years, and that's the good thing. I mean, I, I should have emphasized it before. I think we have a bit of time. Unless, you know, now uh, inflation goes through the roof and interest rates have to follow, we, I think we have a lot. We have some time. We have a couple of years. But, you know, it's, it's closely linked to the question of what is the equilibrium interest rate, which is very low right now. But given the changing demographics that we will have, I mean, the, it, things can go in many directions. But if you think about, I mean, I talk to pension fund people, when I ask them, okay, when are your accumulation of assets gonna peak? They say 2030, 2035, then we have so many old people, they will want to draw down their assets. So the, at some point, the, the kind of this, this bonanza that we are in and this boon for uh, interest rates or that also came from demographics will end. So my time horizon would be indeed five to 10 years. I mean, in 2030, 2035, we'll be in a different world. Uh, clearly in a different world. So does this mean we have to rush into action? I mean, the good thing is that actually we don't. We can take the necessary time to introduce structural reforms, to get our budget safe, to ring fence productive spending. Uh, we have time, but I, my advice to governments would be to, to start and not to waste time on discussing how we can maybe get more space for, for increases of spending than later you, that later you don't get down. The politics is, is, is difficult of this. Yeah, since we are coming to a, to a close, let me ask a final question which hopefully also uh, includes some elements of questions that have been posed in the chat, but we don't have the time to, to deal with them. Um, that is, if you go back to um, an institution like EIA, IIB, a big infrastructure investment bank, that thinks, yeah, I think, in a, in a systemic and global and long-term way about uh, the countries they are funding, but also the debts that they are imposing on these countries. So do you see any policy instrument in funding of those countries, let's say, infrastructure investment that has an element of sustainability in it? So how does the sustainability concern translate into the funding policy so the financing policy of an institution like, like AIIB. Do you have any insights there or any advice to give? <clears throat> well, that's a great question. Uh, thanks for allowing me to make that link to my current employer. <clears throat> I think there are four. The first one is that um, the, uh, um, the, our bank, like some of the other multilateral development banks, tries to... Um, to encourage and mobilize private finance. I mean, private financing is still dead, but the likelihood that it, the projects are well managed and that then they are only done when the projects are sustainable is higher. And we have a 50% private finance mobilization target by 2000. <laughs> We're already at like 25, so it's pretty good. Is it, is it co-financing, if I may ask? Is it co-financing? or it, it is many things. It is many things. It can be equity investment, debt investment, uh, project financing, co-financing. But <clears throat> this brings me to the second point. This, that is standards. Standards in institution building. I mean, we all serious multilateral development banks are now have very serious standards for that are related to sustainability. You know, environmental, social, governance. And these standards say, if we want to invest in a fund, the clients that the fund invests in have to comply by our standards, by social environmental standards, and they, they have to also be in line with the parents align, with Paris commitment. So, so th this is really important, this institution building side of our financial investment, in the sense that it, um, it helps, uh, you know, to get this trickle down through the financial sector of high standards. Infrastructure is, you know, we think of infrastructure, big motorways, railways, whatnot. Most of infrastructure is relatively small scale, local, regional, and often too small to be financed directly by MDBs. But with this channel, we can introduce the whole governance and sustainability dimension into that small scale infrastructure world. So that is, that is very important. Um, a third uh, element is the governance of the MDB itself. Um, you know, 
there are big differences. And I, I'm afraid to say that a lot of the money that advanced countries put on the table is basically going into so-called trust funds, one could to my mind also call them slush funds, but maybe somebody's insulted if I call it that, where basically uh, nationally pro projects in the national interest are financed often, you know, yes, they comply by all the procurement rules and all that, but I mean, you know, markets are cornered, uh, certain projects, certain countries target, so you get a lower efficiency than if, say to speak, the money was really under proper multilateral governance. And in that sense, uh, um, the AIB is special because the, we will do our first concessional financing facility now with the money under the governance of the bank. And in another way we are different is that we, in most MDBs, the governments decide on the projects. They literally decide on every project. So you can imagine what kind of political economy environment uh, is, uh, is, is, is emerging. And in our case, we have a lot of delegation. Uh, so projects are decided by management. Management is responsible. And we, have, we are a bank that uh, has financial sustainability as a trademark. So we are not going to ask for more capital when we have spent our own. So the, I'm not saying the MDB, the AIB is the, the best of all, but I'm just trying to say that we are, it, when the bank was founded, we tried to incorporate a couple of features that would deal with some of the uh, challenges of the existing multilateral development bank community. But on the whole, the collaboration there is very good. Uh, and I think the, the sustainability dimension is, is, is really a, a key component. Yeah, thank you, Luca. I think this was a very um, uh, interesting outlook also to combine the sustainability issue beyond today's political action uh, uh, with these more lasting governance construction uh, issues, right? So how do we set up systems and rules? I, I forgot local, local currency finance as the fourth element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very important. And, you know, here we have institutional obstacles in our banks where we are really trying to grapple with, because right now what we see is that pension funds can invest unhedged in local currency finance if they have a 10, 20 year horizon and MDBs can't. So we have, we have a big uh, governance challenge there where I think local currency finance is one of the most important elements for infrastructure provision in uh, emerging and because all the revenues are in local currency. Yeah, so, and, the, and the risk sharing of course is very different <laughs> So Very countries can go bust if they so, do it. So, so. Yeah, that's a okay, big so challenge the, for the AIIB, just as for the others. I must admit. Yeah, yeah. So I'm looking forward to your new book. We may have a chapter on that also. Yeah. So, <laughs> not really, but uh, I, I I hope you will be interested in it in any way. Yeah, yeah. So thank you, Ludger, for your time and for your presentation. Um, um, maybe Otmar want to say a, a, a few words as a as a uh, as a last word, so to speak, in this talk. But from my side, I want to say um, thank you also to the participants for posing very interesting questions and and quite a lot of them. I haven't mentioned all of them, but I tried to uh, represent them as uh, as representatively as as possible. Um, so thank you, everybody. Otmar, do you, do you want to say a, a, a last word, maybe? I think you, this was um, uh, another interesting meeting with, with Lutka, and we have touched upon quite a number of uh, issues which will be very relevant for the next decade, as he has indicated. And I would have liked uh, to discuss with him the European situation, which is special. Uh, but indirectly, I think we can also get some conclusions from what he presented on the global level. Jan, uh, as always, uh, perfect moderation. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I join you in thanking Lutka in first place and all participants. Uh, see you for our next lecture in rather soon. Thank you. Stay healthy and goodbye to everybody. Thank you all from my side as well.